God is trustworthy, reliable, righteous. He always keeps his word. His reputation is based on the fact he keeps his word. If God says, I'm coming tomorrow at 7 o'clock, he comes at 7 o'clock. Now we come at 7-ish. God comes at 7. You see, if God is not precise, you cannot trust prophecy. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said unto him, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted unto him for righteousness. God is good and all the time good afternoon everyone good afternoon everyone <laughs> always remember i'm your guest so you must treat me nicely it's nice to see you god bless you i hope all has gone well for you up to this point you look as if that is the case and we thank god for that and when i say we thank god i really mean it there were times in history past when gathering for church like this meant risking your lives. In some parts of the world, this is still the case today. But on a broader scale, we will come to the point where we will not be able to worship like this. And so we thank God that we still have this sweet, sweet privilege called freedom of worship. Because one day soon the dragon will speak and when the dragon speaks, these freedoms will vanish away. But God will not lower the standard of righteousness he requires of us. Whether in good times or in bad times, God requires the reflection of the image of his son. Thanks for coming. It is now 3.03. I'll release you by 3.45. Then possibly, hopefully, I will see you this evening when the holy hours are upon us. Our subject for this evening, a closer look at Christ. What did I say? A closer look at Christ, not this evening, but this afternoon. Before I jump into that message, please continue to do what you've done so well, which is preserve reverence in the house of God. Thank you so much for that. And God also thanks you. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. And I tell you, I need that help. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And I want to speak the words of God because Jesus said of his words, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. There's life in the word of God. And favor number three, think as you listen. Isaiah 1.18, come now, let us do what? Reason together, saith the Lord. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you so much, dear God, for affording us this glorious privilege of coming to your house to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you, dear God, for life. We thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for the lovely weather. If we have sinned against you, forgive us, dear God, and give us more and more love for righteousness, which is love for obedience. And love for obedience means hatred for sin. We ask for the presence of your spirit among us, that he may speak through me and enlighten the understanding of your lovely people gathered in your presence. 
Father, keep me conscious that I am in this desk for your glory, not for mine. And so that God suppress my carnal nature, Father, and accept me as I humble myself before you, but accept me in the name of Jesus. Bless those who are sick, remove their illnesses, Father, particularly COVID-19. Guide this country, I pray, please, and be merciful to your people in Ukraine. There is some suffering going on right now. Father, I commit myself to your service now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. When Christ was on this earth, the people who heard him and saw him frequently said, what manner of man is this? When he silenced the storm in Mark chapter 4, 37 to 41, the Bible says in the last verse of Mark chapter 4, And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this? And I want to take a closer look at Christ today because there is controversy regarding who Christ is. Controversy outside of the church and controversy within the church, particularly as it, come to, as it comes to the Trinity. Is there such a thing as the Trinity or is Christ the same person expressing himself in three different ways as I have heard people say? So we will take a close look at Christ and see if Christ is one person expressing himself in three different ways, but actually one person. And we will reason together this afternoon and hopefully we will come to the conclusion that Christ is a member of the heavenly family and he is as fully divine as is the Father and the Spirit. Let us go to John 13. The Gospel of John chapter 13, we'll read verse 16. And remember, we have to reason together. John chapter 13, we'll read from verse, or just verse 16. And I'm reading, of course, from the King James Version of the Bible. John 13, reading verse 16. This is Jesus speaking. Verily, verily, I say unto you, read with me now, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Keep this in mind. Now, when you read, the servant is not greater than his Lord, how many people are in that statement? Two, identify them. The servant and the Lord. Now, let's read the next part of that verse. Neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. How many people in that statement? Identify them. The sender and the sent, yes. The one sending and the one sent because one is higher than the other. Are you with me? Or are you with the Bible? One is higher than the other. Now, having established that, let us go to John 17. John 17. We shall read verse 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, finish the verse, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Now, question for you. Is someone sent in that verse? Yes or no? Yes. Who was sent? Jesus. By whom? Then how many people? Two. Which means Christ cannot send himself. Because the sender is greater than the one sent. Well, let me remind you of John 13, 16. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. And two chapters later, John 15, verse 20, Christ repeats that. He said, remember the word that I spake unto you. The servant is is not greater than his Lord. The servant does not send the Lord, finish my words, the Lord sends the servant. The Lord has greater authority. So Christ is saying the Father has greater authority than he has, which is biblically true. Fully divine, each one, but the Father has greater authority. And so we read in John 17 verse 3, Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And if you take time to read through the gospel of John, more than any other gospel, you will run into, Father sent me, the Father sent me, the Father sent me. Establishing the fact which any honest person will accept, 
that there are two people at least, without even considering the Holy Spirit, but we'll get to the Holy Spirit. The Father sends the Son. There must be two. Let's look at the Ten Commandments as we take a closer look at Christ, a closer look at Christ. We look at the Ten Commandments. We shall go over them, but just briefly, not stating all the words of every commandment. Commandment one, thou shall have no other gods before me. That shows love for whom? God. Commandment two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image and don't worship them. That also is love for God. Commandment three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Love for God. Commandment four, remember the Sabbath day, love for God. Now we know the last six. Don't take, uh, honor your father, your mother, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't covet our interaction with our neighbor. Now we have love for God, love for your neighbor. Are you following me? Amen. Now, as I said a few nights ago, what is missing from the Ten Commandments with respect to who you should love? Love God, love your fellow man, who's missing? Sorry. Love you. There is no self-love in the Ten Commandments. Are you with me? The love that God requires of us, the love that makes up God, God is love, must have an object outside of itself. For God so loved the world that he gave. There is no self-love in the Ten Commandments. And this is the whole duty of man. Therefore, if God is love, there must be someone God loves. <clears throat> so the, the family of God cannot be just one person. Or that person cannot be described as love. Love must have an object upon which it pours itself. All right. And so the Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. We'll get to the Holy Spirit. Let us go to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews 5, we'll read from verse 1. Our subject, a closer look at Christ. The book of Hebrews, chapter 5. And Hebrews is very precious to seven the Adventists, along with Daniel and Revelation. Chapter 5 from verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself is compassed about with infirmity. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. Now, this is the high priest. Now, read verse 4 with me. What does that say? And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is what? Called of God as was Aaron. Now, we're looking at the office of the priest. What does verse 4 say? Did Aaron make himself the priest? Yes or no? No. Well, look at the verse. No man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God. In other words, the high priest must be made a high priest by someone else. Is Christ our high priest? Yes or no? Did he make himself the high priest? Let the Bible tell you that. Read the very next verse. What does that say? Read with me. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made what? An high priest. But he that said unto him, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now the Bible is clear. Jesus Christ did not make himself the high priest. Did you read that in verse 5? Yes. Then someone else made him high priest. Because the priest cannot make himself high priest. Are you following me? Yeah. So those who say Christ is the same person in different expressions are saying that he made himself high priest. The Bible says the high priest must be made high priest by somebody else. Is that clear? Yes. What's our subject? A closer look at Christ. Christ is not one person expressed in three different ways. Christ is one person, a member of the heavenly family whom we call the Godhead. Having said that, let us go to Luke 4. 
Now, Christ wasn't only a high priest. What else was Christ? What was he on the earth? Come on. There are the three major offices in the Jewish system. What are they? Prophet? Come on. Priest? Come on. And king. What was Christ on the earth? Prophet, yes. Now let's go to Luke chapter 4. We read verse 18 of Luke chapter 4. Our subject, a closer look at Christ. Let me pray again. Father, I am talking about the superstar of the Bible, Jesus Christ, your son. Help me to take my time and to speak with reverence. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Read with me. Because he hath what? Anointed me. Come on. To preach the gospel to the poor. Now read carefully the next statement. He hath sent me to do what? Heal the brokenhearted. Stop. What did we discover about someone sending someone? There has to be two. And the one who sends is higher than the one who sends. Christ in his humanity was subject to the authority of the Holy Spirit. Listen to my words carefully. Christ, come on, in his humanity was subject to the authority of the Holy Spirit. Now read verse 18 again for me. Come on. The Spirit of the Lord hath is upon me, come on, because he hath anointed me to do what? To preach the gospel. To the so who anointed Christ? The Holy Spirit. But he did it for the Father. Let's go to Acts chapter 10. The book of Acts chapter 10. Because all members of the Godhead work together. They really do. And that's how the church should work. There is no conflict in the Godhead. That's the way a family should be. That's the way the church should be. That's why when God made Adam and Eve in his image, the family must be a reflection of the image of God. You have Acts chapter 10. Let's read verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. That's Acts 10, 38. Now, what does that verse say? How God did what? Anointed Jesus Christ or Jesus of Nazareth. But what does Jesus say of himself in Luke 4, 18? The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me. Yes, the spirit anointed Christ, but at the direction, finish my words, of the Father. And the Spirit sent him. And Jesus says, the one who sends is greater than the one who is sent. Let's go to John 14. John chapter 14. Let's read verse 26. You have that? Read with me. What does that say? But the Comforter, which is the? Whom the Father will send in my name. Now, we have the word send again. Who is sending whom in that verse? The Father, come on, is sending the Holy Spirit. Tell me something about the relationship between the Father and the Holy Spirit. The Father has greater authority than the Spirit. Why? Because the Father sends the Holy Spirit. Now go to John 15. Read verse 26 for me. But when the comforter is come, whom I will do what? Uh-huh. Stop. Do we have send again in that verse? Who's sending whom? Christ now, but Christ where? On earth or Christ in heaven? Christ in heaven. Now, back where he came from, he has the authority to send the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? If you're not, tell me, let me go over this again. In heaven, Christ has the authority. That's why the disciples spoke in tongues. Christ sent those gifts through the Spirit. So when he went back, he said, I will send the Spirit from the Father. <laughs> from the Father, Christ gives the commission the Spirit goes. Let us add to that by going to John 16, verse 13. John 16, verse 13, the very next chapter, our subject, a closer look at Christ. Listen to the words of Christ very carefully. Howbeit, 
When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he what? will show you things to come. Now, look at the expression, he shall not speak of himself. That does not mean he will not talk about himself. It means he does not speak on his own authority. But whatsoever he shall hear, no angel can tell the Holy Spirit what to say. Are you following me? Because the Holy Spirit is divine. The only person or persons that can tell the Spirit of God what to say is the Father or the Father and the Son. That's it. So when the verse says, he shall not speak of himself, it means he does not speak of his own authority. When he speaks, he is speaking what he got from the Father, transmitted to the Son, and given to him. Which means, the Father and the Son are higher in authority than the Holy Spirit. Let me add quickly, each one fully divine, but different in levels of authority. Jesus Christ was sent by the Father, and the one who sends is greater than the one sent, but there must be two personalities for one to send the other. So Christ cannot be, as some people praise, the same person just expressing himself in different ways. We are talking about three separate individuals in the Godhead insofar as the Bible gives us information. Because anything having to do with God will have layers that we do not understand because God is God. But God gives us enough to come to reasonable honest conclusions. The servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Keep this in mind and listen to the words of Christ in John 14 verse 28. Let's go there. John 14 verse 28, our subject, a closer look at Christ. John chapter 14, and you're supposed to say slow down. You have Brother Peter, you're not keeping me in check. <laughs> I couldn't tell it was 14. 14. Ah. Well, if I slow down, I'll solve that problem. All right. Are we at John 14, verse 28? Do we have that? Amen. Read with me. What does that say? Ye have heard how I, I go away and come again unto you. If ye love me, you would rejoice. Why? Because I said I go to the Father, for thy Father is greater than I. In authority, in his humanity, the Father was greater and the Spirit was greater. In his humanity, when he returned to heaven, he now sent the Holy Spirit. John 15, verse 26. What am I trying to tell you? Christ is a separate individual from the Father and from the Holy Spirit. What am I trying to tell you? Christ is under the authority of the Father and so is the Holy Spirit. What am I trying to tell you? The person who sends is greater than the person who is sent. What am I trying to tell you? Christ as a high priest could not make himself the high priest. That's what the Bible says. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 5. Someone had to make him high priest. Now we know the sanctuary is a shadow of something greater. It is a type of the antitype. In the type, Moses anointed Aaron. Now you tell me, who does Aaron represent? You took too long. Whom does Aaron the high priest represent? Jesus Christ. Well, whom did Moses represent? God. And we read in Exodus chapter 4, uh, verses uh, 15 to 17, that God told Moses, I will make you a God to Aaron. Mm -hmm. And in Exodus chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall be a God to Pharaoh. You'll talk to Aaron. Aaron will talk to Pharaoh. So symbolically, Moses was God anointing Aaron, who represented Christ. Two people. If what I said so far is clear, say amen. amen. All right. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank God. 
and for his word. Let me pray, then we take another look. Father, as I continue, you have to be with me, dear God, so that I represent your son correctly. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Go with me to Psalm 90. We looked at that, was it last night or the night before? Psalm 90, 9 zero. Psalm 90. <laughs> Do you have that, my lovely friends? Who wrote that psalm? I told you. Moses, yes, brother Moses, is the, one of the most powerful psalms in the, in the entire 150. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth of the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, finish the verse, thou art God. Now, you and I cannot fully understand what everlasting means. We just cannot. We are conditioned to limited periods of time. Three score and ten. Hmm? Even today, we cannot understand 969, the lifespan. Of, we cannot understand that. You look at the Bible, even the Bible writers did not fully understand. Because when Moses wrote of the death of Abraham, Moses said, Abraham lived to 175. He, was, he lived to a good old age. He was full of years. That's what Moses wrote. Well, what would Moses have said about Methuselah? He said, Abraham died full of years because Moses' mind had been conditioned to the way things were at that time. David said three score and ten and if by reason of strength they be four score years yet is their strength labor and sorrow for it is soon cut off and we fly away. And so we do not understand someone who lives to be 900 years. When some, my mother died at 98 and when I tell people that they say oh oh 98 in the days of Methuselah, 98, you were a boy. <laughs> Methuselah lived to be 189 before he had his first child. Lamech was 182 before he had, uh, Methuselah was 187. Lamech, 182. Jared, 162 before he had his first child. Noah was 500 years old before he had his first child. Are you with me? It's as if he was born when Columbus sailed the ocean blue and had his first child you know, in 1990-something. I mean, this is beyond our imagination. Now, having said all of that, listen to the verse again. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth. What is he saying? Before what? Creation. Mm -hmm. Or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Now, look at verse 1. What's the first word in verse 1? What's the last word in verse 2? Are you sure? The first word in verse 1 is Lord. The, first, the last word in verse 2 is God. Moses is saying the Lord is God. Are you following me? Now go to Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1, we read from verse 8. Our subject, a closer look at Christ. Do you have that? Yes. Hebrews 1, verse 8. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Verse 10, and thou what? Lord, in the beginning, hast laid the foundation of the earth. Which deity or divinity, divine name, is mentioned in verse 8? What divine name? God. What divine name is mentioned in verse 10? Lord. Didn't, didn't we, did, did we not find those two names in Psalm 90 verses 1 and 2? Yes. And it is said of that person, the person has been there from everlasting to everlasting. That's Moses writing under the inspiration of the Spirit. What we read in Hebrews is the Father speaking directly. 
And the father calls the son God in Hebrews 1.8. Calls him Lord in Hebrews 1.10. Why does he call him Lord? And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. Before the mountains were brought forth, Psalm 90 verse 2, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world. What am I trying to tell you? The person in Psalm 90 verses 1 and 2, and the person in Hebrews 1, 8 to 10, are the same. Mm -hmm. Don't hesitate. I've told you before. Speak with confidence, even when you're wrong. But you're not wrong. The person in Psalm 90, 1 and 2, and Hebrews 1, 8 to 10, is the same person. Put a name to that person. Christ. The creator. And only God can create. But let's see. They're two separate people again. Go to Ephesians chapter 3. Let's read verse 9. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9, our subject, a close look at Christ. The world needs to understand who Christ is. If you demote Christ from his true position, you cannot be saved. Simple as that. Ephesians 3, reading verse 9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world, finish the verse, hath been hidden God, come on, who created all things by Jesus. In other words, when Christ created, he created as an agent of the Father. And so we have two again. Go to Hebrews 1. We read from verse 1 of Hebrews 1. Back to Hebrews. Do we have Hebrews 1? From verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Now we have two people. Hmm? We have God. Speaks to us how? By his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Finish verse 2. By whom also he made the world. This is telling us precisely what we learned in Ephesians 3 verse 9. That Christ created as an agent of the Father. And since only a divine being can create. We have two divine beings, but one in subjection to the other. We have two Human beings in a marital relationship, one in subjection to the other. But each one is 100% a spouse. Are you following me? Jesus divine, 100%. The Father divine, 100%. The Father, Christ, Christ in subjection to the Father. My brothers and sisters, let's go now to Matthew chapter 3. Our subject, a closer look at Christ. Matthew chapter 3. Let's read from verse sorry, 16 of Matthew 3. Read with me. And Jesus, when he was baptized, keep reading, went up straight away. Out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw what? Spirit. Stop. Did Jesus see something, yes or no? Yes. Then there are two things. There are two, two entities. Jesus and what he saw. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and doing what? Lighting upon him. Now, in what condition was Christ? In human condition, of course, God as well, but divinity clothed and hidden in humanity. Christ as a human being was restricted. He could not be two places at the same time. In his human restriction, he's in the water. He could not be in the water and coming down out of heaven at the same time because his human condition would not permit him to do that. As a matter of fact, he still does not do that because he still has human form. That's why he enters it by the spirit, not he himself. And so he saw the Spirit of God descending from heaven like a dove 
enlightening upon him. And so we have two geographical locations. Name them. The water. And who comes out of the water? Jesus. What's the other geographical location? Heaven. Who comes out of heaven? The spirit in the form of a dove. Now, we have a voice. The spirit has left heaven, so he's no longer there. He's on the shoulder of Christ. But where does the voice come from? Heaven. We have the voice from heaven. We have the spirit in the form of a dove. And that's not odd. He came in the form of fire in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. And we have Christ soaking wet coming out of that river. How many do we have? Three. Go to John 14. Let's read from verse 16. No, let's not go there yet. Let's go to John 2. John 2. Let's read verse uh, 18. You have John 2, verse 18. Read for me. What does that say? Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign shows what? Unto us, seeing that thou doest these things, give us a sign, they said. Jesus said, answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple. Come on. And in three days I will raise it up. That's his sign. Next verse. They said unto him, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and will thou raise it in three days? They thought he meant the literal temple where they worship. It took 46 years to build it. Read the next verse. But he spake of the temple of his body. So when he said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up, what was he saying? You kill me, I will get up after three days. Now, it's important to understand, he said, I will raise it. Not the Father. I will raise it. But, go to John 10. John chapter 10, let's read verse 18. Our subject, a closer look at Christ. Are you at John 10, Amen. verse 18? This is Christ speaking. No man taketh it from me, meaning his life. But I lay it down, come on, of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my father. Now the father told him when to do two things particularly. When to die. Mm -hmm. When to raise up. Mm -hmm. Now, question for you. Was it the father who killed him? No. He did what? He laid down his life. Now he said, I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up. It wasn't the father who killed him. It wasn't the father who raised him. It was the father who commanded him when to give it up and when to take it up. Now you read many verses that say the God raised him. Yes, the verses say that because Christ obeyed the father's command. Because he obeyed, it is written as if the father raised him. Because he came up in obedience to the Father's command. Listen to me carefully. If someone else had raised Jesus from death, which is the ultimate enemy, we would have a savior, a so-called savior, who needed help to save us. But go to Hebrews chapter 1. Let's read verse 3. Hebrews 1 verse 3. I'm feeling an urge. I need to preach this sermon tonight again. That's the urge I'm feeling. Hmm? Hebrews 1, verse 3. Are you there? Read with me. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Carefully now. When he had by himself purged our sin, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high by himself and that purging involved dying and rising by himself but at the command of the father go to Genesis chapter 18 let me show you something you 
Abraham sees three strangers coming to his tent. He invites them and he makes a meal for them. Let's read from verse 7 of Genesis 18. Our subject, a closer look at Christ. It is 340. We have five minutes, hopefully. Do you have Genesis 18, verse 7? Amen. Read for me. And Abraham did what? Ran right into the herd and fetched a calf tender and good. And he gave it unto a young man. Come on. And he hastened to dress it. Now, how many people do we have in verse 7? Two. Name them. Abraham and the young man. Who dressed, who chose the calf? Who dressed it? The young man. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're seeing that. Abraham chose the calf. The young man dressed it. What do you understand by dressed it? He seasoned it to cook it. Now read verse 8. And he took butter and milk. Uh huh. Wait a minute. <laughs> verse 8 said, who dressed it? No, 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 no. Verse 8. Abraham. Mm -hmm. Now why can't verse 8 say that Abraham dressed it? Because the young man dressed it at Abraham's command. And so it was Abraham's work. And so the Bible can say Abraham took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed. But the physical work was done by the young man at Abraham's command. And by obeying Abraham's command, that virtually became Abraham's work. By the way, when you and I obey God, our work becomes God's work. Mm -hmm. When you and I obey, that is God's work through us. So the father said to the son, son, this is when you die. Not this is when I kill you. This is when you die. You must lay down your life and then you must demonstrate the power to take it up again. To conquer death. To conquer hell, to conquer the grave, to conquer sin, to conquer Satan. Christ raised himself because Christ was fully and still is fully divine. Amen. A closer look at Christ. If Christ is less than God, the best he can expect in a battle with Satan is a draw. Mm -hmm. And no one is saved because of a draw in a battle with Satan. There must be victory. And Christ as God provides that victory. Amen. When you pray in the name of Jesus, you pray in the name of someone who met every temptation the devil brought and resisted. You pray in the name of someone who long before he became human, he defeated Satan in a heavenly battle. He came to the earth in human form. Satan attacked him. He defeated Satan in every temptation. He voluntarily went into Satan's territory, death. He came back. Satan could not hold him. You know what Satan got the Jews to do? Put a stone, big stone on the, on the, the, the mouth of the cave. And then seal it, then put guards, trying to keep Christ in the grave. But Christ came up by the power that was in him. How can I explain that? I cannot. I accept it by faith. Amen. When you and I come up, we'll come up at the voice of Christ. Christ came up by his own power, but at the command of the Father. My brothers and my sisters, Jesus Christ is fully God, fully divine, because only God can save us. Only God can create. And only God can conquer the devil. When Christ sent Gabriel to Cyrus in Daniel chapter 10, Gabriel told Daniel he wrestled for three weeks against the prince of Persia. The prince of Persia is a name for Satan. Three weeks he battled Satan for the mind of Cyrus and could not gain the victory. Gabriel said, until Michael came to help me, who is Michael? Jesus Christ. The highest angel in heaven is Gabriel. Now, observe this quickly. Here's God the Father. Here's God the Son. Here's God the Holy Ghost. There, that's the level of authority. Fully divine, but different levels of authority. Right under them is Gabriel. Are you with me? Right under them is Gabriel. Gabriel could not get past Satan. I'm not glorifying Satan. I just want you to understand you need Jesus as much as Gabriel did. Mm -hmm. He said, Michael came to help me. 
Christ himself, because only Christ can conquer Satan. Hmm. Say with me, if you will, Father, I recommit my life to you, and I re-accept Christ as my all-sufficient Savior. Can I see your hand? Ah, God bless you. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus. He is fully divine. He is equal with you in divinity, in nature, in power. But you have great authority. Dear God, help us when we pray, to pray with the confidence. We're praying in the name of someone who has defeated Satan every time they have met. And when he comes a second time on the third, he will complete that conquest. And we, through union with Christ, can overcome the enemy. We thank you for sending someone equal with yourself. Now, Father, we recommit our lives to you. Receive us in his name, I pray. Bring us back tonight to hear your word again. We pray in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Our promise is all. It stands as the sun. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast till I come. Hear Elder Randy Ski nightly at 7 p.m. on GMI TV from Sunday, October 9 through Saturday, October 22nd. God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. <laughs> 